Welcome, everybody, to the show. Joining me is our intrepid co-host and fellow traveler, Dan Dan, the Dan Dan Noodles Man, the Fritz Wiki of Wargaming. And his fine, dashing who's hat. Fr who's Fritz Wiki? Fritz Zwicky. Zwicky? Swiss American astronomer. Uh, known for, see, known for being cantankerous. Just it it's how long have we been on? 52 seconds? Already 50, you make not, it look not, stupid. Not even, not even. Fritz Wicky was a brilliant guy. I'll, I'll have you know. Anyway, a little scattered. I'm just saying. Good comparison. Hey, can I show you what I got in the mail? Go ahead. Go yeah. ahead. Firelog Games. I, I guess I must have solicited them, or I don't remember asking them for this, but check this out, man. Uh <laughs> you know you always have to fucking out. You always have to outdo me, eh? Yeah, yeah. You always have to get me demonetized, Dan. <laughs> this actually sounds pretty cool. Somebody was working on. I can't remember who this was. Whether it was David Thompson or or um, or Clint Davy or somebody like that that was working on a game, and I I suggested the title War Stories for them, but these people had already taken that name. This actually looks kind of neat. And I've always I've always. Look, if I'm going to play... That is the extent of my informed status on this product, by the way. Well, I mean, if I want to play an RPG, I want to play my favorite era uh, in, in war, it's, which is World War II. I'd love to play this, man. Okay, there you go. There's a was an entire line of GURPS World War II source books back in the golden age of GURPS, back with GURPS 3rd edition. I mean, they RPG? had, I don't know. Yeah, they had like six or seven different support products for World War II. They were you definitely know, not that graphically fancy, I can tell you that, but... I, I I tried to get in touch with uh, Steve Jackson because he's available for interviews, but they never returned my email. Oh well, perhaps Steve is frozen this week. I don't know. I don't so, know. That's all I. That's all I got to. That, that's the only idea I got. So in Texas. In Texas, yeah. It snowed in Texas. No, Steve is a famed cryogenics uh, activist. Oh. That see, wants to wait. He's going to get frozen after he dies and re revivified in 150 years when they've discovered what it is that killed him. He re like, what's he paying for something like that, man? I don't know. I have not. I have not done any research on that. But Steve's talked about it. It's not like that's a big secret or anything. It's and what, what, what's he going to wake up with that fascist Walt Disney? Uh, I don't know. I don't. I think I'm pretty sure the whole idea that they froze Walt Disney is probably mythological. But St Steve is serious about it, as far as I can tell. So, anyway, so we're going to talk tonight about historicity and and a a concept that is related due to where we're at here because we're in war games, right? How historical. Uh, are war games should war games be and then we have the this phenomenon called gelman amnesia which is named after the physicist murray gelman oh, I, thought uh, but it's, shock, I thought that was a uh, a shock to me there amnesia no no you had dan amnesia where you forgot that we are having a show last tuesday but other than that everything's great um <laughs> dan has already been bitched at about folks we don't we don't need to rag on him anymore um so uh, what, what Gelman amnesia is, is um, this phenomenon where we read an article. This is the context in which the, 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 the phenomenon is explained, typically. But it's, this is totally applicable to, instead of reading an article, you think about playing a war game. Um, you'll, you'll pick up the newspaper and you'll read this article. And the, to the topic of the article will be something that you happen to know something about. And you'll read the article and you'll say this article is bullshit it is this, this person is wrong on all these facts has drawn a completely erroneous conclusion this article is is bad 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 because it is drawing it's it's working from wrong or incomplete facts and is drawing spurious conclusions but then you'll like flip the page and read the next article about something that you don't happen to personally know that much about and completely forget that the, you just read some line of spurious bullshit on page one, right? So the the, the analog here in war games is, and you can extend this as far as you, this, this analogy as far as you like, the, uh, you know, it, it, we play a war game, maybe, maybe we play a second war game by the same designer or the same publisher or whatever. And because it's a topic, that first game is a topic that we know a lot about, 
we find all these problems with it. it's like well this couldn't happen this way and this is very ahistorical and and you know this this particular thing definitely didn't happen this behavior that the game incentivizes is 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 is, is wrongly put forward and then you play the next game could be a game in the same series i'll, I'll use a personal example of ocs in this case um and you you'll forget about all that stuff all all of those problems that you just identified in the previous thing so in, in my case you know you got uh beyond the rhine it's one of the bigger ocs games it's the biggest ocs game that's set on the west front of world war ii right now I'm an, I don't consider myself an expert on any historical topic, just to make that absolutely clear. But I'm, I know a, something about World War II in, on the West Front, right? Especially, you know, especially that, that, that 19, you know, D-Day onward West Front, not 1940 so much. Um, I know probably less about the East Front. Now, that's, to some extent, that's because there's more to know, right? And I, you know, I can tell you a decent amount about specific things like, the siege of Leningrad, but Art, Art, let, let me ask you. Let me ask you. And I'm going to start. I got to. I got to go read up on that. Right. Go ahead. Let me ask you something, Artie. Um, you just. You just. A light bulb uh, went on in my head, and uh, you Ding. said you know, you know uh, um, a lot about the Western uh, uh, theater of operations as opposed to the Eastern theater of operation. Now, I'm going to say that's the majority. Why of Americans? Uh, and no, probably Canadians, uh, because I'm I'm I prefer West Front mm -hmm. than East Front, but East Front is where shit was happening, man. So re remember that you know in if if we look at that same period between I, I don't really want to get distracted before I've even made the identified the topic, uh, but that like eighty percent of the German army at in mid nineteen forty four, you know, when D Day's happening, like eighty percent I forget the actual number, but like eighty percent of the German army is not in France pretending no. to protecting the beaches against an Allied invasion. No. They're in the Soviet no. they're they're on the East Front fighting furiously against the Soviets and and losing by then. Okay. So so there's like a, a greater mass of information. There's more battles, there's more campaigns. The what's there often is bigger um so there's like just there's there's more learning curve on the east front plus the sources are not as good in english yeah, right, right exactly it's exactly. there's there's only until maybe the last 20 30 years or so have we really started to see easily found good information on the east front from people like david glance and something like that i'm probably getting the period wrong on glance but that that's my example. He's like the standard bearer of of, of information uh, on the war on the East Front, World War II, right? So the point is that you know we we, we will easily identify historical problems in games if they're uh, topics that we know a lot about, right? I, again, go back to Beyond the Rhine. If you look at that opening situation at the very beginning of September in Beyond the Rhine, and it's. It, it, it really doesn't reflect what then happened in the first two weeks of September, right? Um, there's a there's an asymmetry between the historical events that are very hard. I don't want to say impossible, but very hard to replicate uh, in that game. Uh, and then yet I could go to the East Front and play out, you know, Smolensk, which is a battle I didn't know a ton about until I played the game, right? So, so that's the point. And again, we're talking this different game designers, but same series designer, same publisher, look games, you know, graphic unified graphical look. To what extent is this annoying? Um, and to what extent do we even care about it? Maybe we don't even really care, right? I mean, as a, as if if we're kind of doing this to explore the history anyway, right? Maybe we're fine with it. Maybe we'll eventually get annoyed by the a historical elements in other games as we well, as we a has a, a, a you know, when a game is historical, when it stays on your shelf, because as soon as you put it down, other than the replacements or the, the new wave of whatever, mm -hmm. it's all hypothetical, man. So, well, a game that doesn't get played is a you know, there's people that I, I'm not gonna nay say against people who like to collect stuff. Okay, I get I get that. I have collector urges. Um, ultimately, games, you know, like whiskey's made to be drunk, but there are still people that collect it. War games are made to be played, but there are still people that collect them. And I get that. 
Uh, did you see Marco? This came up on, on my stream last night, but I had already wow. known about it because I watched Marco's wow. video. He, he had like, I don't know what, five, eight, ten thousand. I don't know what the number 5, was. 5,000 games. Yeah, 5,000 games. He had like a whole building in his backyard that was just storage for these games. And he gave, you know, 98% of them away. He kept like 50 things or something like that. So uh, this is a great example, actually. And this is one thing that, you know, this is why I wanted to talk to Jim uh, Ozarski about the, that movie, right? Um, uh, so it, so in this case, this is maybe a, a really interesting example because I had a pretty visceral reaction, pretty negative reaction to Scott's Napoleon. And, and Was it that pretty, bad, man? A pretty pot. Well, we talked, we had a whole show about this, Dan. I know, it's, but Yes, I mean, it's I... bad, but yeah. it's, it's ahistorical, but it's not bad because it's ahistorical. It's bad because it's bad. Oh. Gladiator is not less ahistorical than N Napoleon was. And I probably know more about the Roman mid mid period Roman Empire than I do about the Napoleonic period. I didn't know at Gladiator least, at least I did when that movie came out. Uh, I and I love that movie. I didn't know Gladiator was a historic piece. What? Yeah. I mean, it's a, the characters that Russell Crowe plays in it is fictional, but and the, the, but there are historical people in it. Marcus Aurelius. Yeah, no, I understand. Guy. I understand. But I mean, the situation itself, the 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 the, the plot. Oh no, the situation itself is bullshit. Right. The, okay. Um. The the bad the the really the only historical thing in the film is, uh, the just like the scenery and the sets. The, that's all well done. Right. Uh, is that battle up at the at the beginning of the movie where it's it's clearly part of the Marco Manic Wars that Marcus Aurelius was engaged in fighting throughout his his uh emperorship um and and really once that battle ends that's about it that's 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 the end of the history lesson in that movie um but that said uh, uh, you know a film potentially can, can convey a lot of historical information without necessarily telling you the historical events right history is not just if it's just not just shit that happened it's how people lived back in you know whatever period and whatever place you're talking about right uh, and Gladiator, like HBO's Rome, did a pretty good sense of sort of conveying at least some of that. Yes, you get a fairly stylized treatment of gladiatorial games and all that stuff, but uh, I thought HBO's Rome was really good at, really good at that, by the way. It's just kind of showing the operation of that culture uh, without necessarily sticking particularly strictly to the historical events that, that it covered. Was that a complete series, or did they just drop it second season in? Uh, so it got two seasons and right. I think the idea was that there was going to be three and the, it sort of accelerated. They, they knew it, the second season was going to uh, be the last season. So they kind of packed two seasons worth of shit into it. Um, the second season feels rushed. Even in the first season, the time frame is a bit compressed, however, but I mean, you, you kind of got to do that because re, you know, in the real world, you got to find an actor and pay, okay, this actor is playing this character. Um, do we want to recast this, you know, actors all the time and stuff like that? It's that's hard to do. So yeah, no, no. Uh, so there's there's reasons why they compress the timeline, and I'm basically okay with it. The uh, the ambiguity of the character of Julius Caesar, I felt, was well conveyed by that series. So anyway, 80 people watching right now, Dan. That's pretty good. I blame the fact that you're back. That we had all these people. I know you had like a thousand people that the when Ranella was on. Uh, it was uh like ninety six or something like that. It was pretty See? good. Say so, yeah. So there I'm glad go. we could do that. Gone. I got so. shit. I got shit for uh for, for not well. I got shit for not being there. Someone actually said, "Ah, finally, no one's screaming." And, uh, yeah, uh, don't make me say it. Don't make me say it. Oh, he he watched. He read the comments at least, folks. He read the comments, so that's all good. <laughs> <laughs> so it, in a way, yeah, you ever, you ever, I, I used to do this with the, with the AD and D dungeon master's guide where I would wish probably in the, you know, or my 83 or something like that, where I would wish I could read it again for the first time, you know? So in a, in a way I, I, I kind of envy players who are like getting to explore a particularly interesting period for the first time. Right. Hey, check out, check this out. This, that, this is great. Huh? 
Is the question, why do we trust people on topics we're uninformed of? That That is kind of the question. Yeah. Um, even where we might have good reason because they bungled some other topic that we are familiar with, why do we trust them? Is it okay? I mean, I, I think I've got to take the position that it's, it's basically okay as long oh, yeah. as everybody's on their own learning journey with this material and, and, you know, they'll get there sooner or later. Right. So, so yeah, I think that, that kind of is the question. Uh, it's not necessarily, uh, you know, it's, it's the girl man amnesia is not like a phenomenon intended to indict anybody or, or, or what, you know, what they like and what they don't. But, um, we were actually pretty nice to you. I could have spent at least 40 minutes, complaining that dan wasn't here last week and i didn't i spent probably <laughs> probably more like 40 seconds but i had an important guest on like the superstar mike Ronella. yeah know? but you know what it's a, it actually worked out good because mike Ronella looks like a very serious type of guy um and uh man yeah you, you know you you got the questions he's got the answers mm -hmm. i actually uh absolutely 100 agree with with jason w's comment here uh, designers notes bibliography are important maybe you, you you find a bunch of historical holes in a game then you look at the bibliography and you look at well this source is bullshit this guy doesn't know what he's talking about what the hell's going on here uh that that can also be illuminated in the designer's notes but one one can also find in the designer so it's not a historicity problem necessarily but uh a an explanation of where the designer was coming from and what they were trying to achieve with that particular game, right? Maybe the thing that you found ahistorical is just not something the designer cared too much about, and they were interested in exploring some other elements of that topic, right? Right, Dan? Yeah, I'm trying to think of something here. Um, uh, John Butterfield Wise and uh, Mark Herman Wise. I mean, well, you know, Mark, Mark, and 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 John are both. Uh, it, Amongst our most eminent designers working today, right? Um, and, and they know they know their, their their history, man. Oh yeah, you look at like, Mark on the Pacific War, for example. Mark's done thirty years, whatever it is, forty years. I don't want to want to make Mark sound too old, but he's done a, a lot of years of history research on the war in the Pacific in World War II, right? So it's like uh, he, he would be for me. He would be the authority on the Pacific War, man. I think that's a pretty reasonable, uh, well, you know, if, if, if I needed to know something and I happen to be talking to Mark, I might ask Mark. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we got some painting done today. Uh, Hexy, that's about it. There's, I'm working on, I don't know if Dan heard this. I'm building a game table, Dan. You're building. Uh, I do it. have some pictures, but they're not like of handy to show on, on the show. Well, um, hold on a second. I'm, you're, you're building it with all, with all the accoutrements around where you could put your well, there's, there's one accoutrement a singular which is a lid that'll fit on top to keep the cats out that's basically well there's i guess uh, there's two there's a shelf underneath too there's not going to be cup holders or any bullshit like that come on uh, you need cup holders no i need to put put the cup on the other table i i need a, a bat to beat you with if you spill a, a cup of beverage on my expensive war game i ain't gonna so, spill anything i'm just saying this has happened somebody there's a legendary story, possibly apocryphal, that came out of Consim World Expo about somebody that dumped a big gulp on a some somebody's case blue game, and presumably when they were released from the hospital, they needed yeah. to buy them a new yeah. case blue. I, I would have lost it. Game. I would have lost it right there and then. Well, you know, it's not. Uh, it's not like that's. I don't know if it was a ex game as expensive as Case Blue, and maybe it wasn't. Uh, I don't care any game as big, but. Well, no, I'd be pissed about that too, because you you know you flew out to friggin' Phoenix to play this game. Now it's now you're now you're hosed, right? Like, I guess we'll yeah. I guess we'll play shoots and ladders for the rest the next rest of the convention, guys. How about that? It's so, like it's like eating chips and moving your chits around. It's like yeah. mm, yeah. oh no, you don't eat you don't eat no Cheetos and handle my counters, man. That that ain't that ain't happening. So uh, these are uh, one. Of my, I love to see more people do this actually. So the uh, GCACW game have this section in the back uh, that dates from the early days of the series back with Avalon Hill called uh, The Game is History. And basically what they do is whatever the game's about, say it's about first or second bull run, they'll like walk you through the historical events in the context of the game, where the pieces go, where the battles get fought, all that stuff. Uh, and it's really amazing. I'd love to see more designers do that. I don't know why more designers don't. I have a, a long-held 
desire to do that with Kevin Zucker's eight game, 1809, actually. Can you give me an example, Artie? That's very interesting what you just said. Give example. me an example of play of you're moving the chit and uh, the guy is explaining to you what's happening historically. There, okay, right? so so well, it's not like a replay, right? Where it's like a, you know, remember the old series replay from the general where they'd like walk you through a game. That's not what this is. This is kind of walking you through. Okay, here's the first second bull run campaign. Uh, here's where the you know the forces were disposed at the beginning of that campaign. Here's how they moved. These are the roads that they moved along. Uh, these are where the engagements happened. There might have been a you know a brief swirling cavalry action over here. Uh, it'll kind of walk you through the how the game how the campaign historically happened in the context of the game and the components, where it'll tell you where the the battles happened and stuff like that. Um, and I think that's awesome. And I'd love to see uh, more designers do that. Or Other no, than the American Civil possible. War. Where, where I see uh, I see that happening. Are there any World War II games where they have the same type of of of, of uh, uh, maybe you think lesson? you'd think so, but I can't think of any examples off the top of my head. I uh, implore the chat if there are any examples of that, let me know. So, but uh, but no, I'd love to see more of that, right? And I, I think that's that lends itself best to like an operational level. Um, which is right. where my sweet spot is anyway, right? So, well, you honestly, you know, I don't know if you need them, but I mean, boy, they're, that's damn handy if you know, because every little like, okay, well, there was a, you know, some small engagement over here at this church that's just like sitting out in the middle of wherever, and those landmarks will be on those maps, right? So, completely agree. Completely agree. In a variety of respects. There you go. Decision games monopoly. He's 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 joking, right? Charles, you're joking. We'll call it he's joking. I can I, I can verify that he's joking. You know how I know? How do you know? Because I because I just know. <laughs> so I you know, I am like I, I would call myself like a medium sarcasm person, okay? And I'm not like extremely sarcastic, but I'm somewhat sarcastic. And, you know, I, I, you know, I've, I've yeah, learned you're sarcastic. To, I've learned to live with that. There are a lot of people, including Dan and my wife and my mother, who have no sense when I'm being sarcastic or not. Yeah, well, so it's, apparently it's, it's, I have fantastic deadpan delivery well, of you got the poker face happening. I yeah, well maybe maybe, but I mean I I I can I could call my mother up and and come. <laughs> I've told this story before. I did this. This was like the exact thing that I did. It's like just out of the blue. It's like yeah, we're considering uh, you know we, you know the, the job's wrapping up pretty soon. I think we're going to move to Svalbard and uh, open an alpaca farm in Svalbard. And she she has no idea what where Svalbard is. Or probably no idea what an alpaca is, and she flips out because she thinks she's no. I'm obviously <laughs> being serious about moving to Svalbard, you know, well, 1500 you miles north of the Arctic Circle. Why would you say that? Just, just to uh -oh. be stupid. God, but I'm gullible, man. So yeah. Now my wife's not quite that bad with 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 not getting when I'm being. Because she knows you. I hope so. Ugh. Ugh. Uh, 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 uh. I'd be, yeah, I'd be upset. I'd be upset. Oh, well. Thank you. I appreciate the extra maps. I got a frame. Uh, so I'm going to actually be working on, at some point, when I get to every, this room done, uh, I'm going to get uh, get to work on framing that out. I think I want to do that work on the table, though. So the table, and it's probably, honestly, the, I'm just the painting is like, I, I've got this bare paint that I'm using for the table surface. And it's like, okay, you have to wait 48 hours between coats. I'm like, really? So, uh, John Stanley, thank you so much for the support. Second bull run does not get much coverage. Pretty even, man. Yeah, uh, well, uh, bull run in general, neither Manassas battle uh, really gets that much coverage. Um, there are certainly a number of examples, particularly at the battle level, um, but not so much. I mean, the, the first bull run looks like a, you know, there's a lot of union troops there, but, uh, it does help that, uh, uh, what's his name? Joe Johnston managed to get there in time, uh, to even up the numbers too. So, oh dear. I didn't know that was going to happen. Sorry about that. 
Um, not so but we're not demonetized yet. So there you go. So nothing is my fault. Yeah, I'm actually building an ark to to uh, to uh, survive the coming apocalypse. You know, I actually have a uh, um, what do you call them though? Those uh, apocalyptic uh, food cans there where you keep them uh, when stuff goes bad, like uh, like electricity and stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? Or when you hear machine guns, you know. Well, there's no uh, there's no shame in being prepared, right? As, no. As, in the words of the late great uh, Richard Roundtree, you can't be too prepared. So who's Richard Roundtree? Shaft. Oh, Shaft. Shaft. I thought you were talking. No, the, the, the first guy who said that was Lord Baden Powell. I don't know, but I, I remember the master. quote. I remember the quote from one of the Shaft movies. Um, so, which are, su su I don't know about surprising, but really actually very good movies. I, I um, love them. The music is fantastic. That's Lalo true, too. Schifrin, man. That's true, too. Uh, the great, uh, the late, great Isaac Hayes is responsible for that uh, Bustin. Uh, main theme there which which was yeah. so good that they couldn't like but when they decided they were going to redo it three times they they couldn't leave it out so uh, nah, that's nah, why that's the, the, the original character in the original movies were so strong that they couldn't abandon it and they end every time they tried to remake it it ended up being a sequel and and was that was that the era of the black exploitation yes okay fantastic but the, but the uh but the Shaft films in particular are some white people went to see those too, uh, because they're 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 good movies, right? Of course, they're good movies. What the hell does that mean? Yeah, Jeez. well, I'm just saying, you know, something like, did you watch? Uh, damn it, what's the thing called? Um, a Netflix original from three or four years ago with Eddie Murphy. Um, shit, uh, it's about Rudy Ray Moore. Where Eddie Murphy plays Rudy Ray Moore, um, I can't remember this. So that's like one of the original black exploitation movies. And uh, I, man, I don't know if I could have gotten behind that movie, but it's it's the the uh, God damn it, what's this damn thing called? Now I gotta look this up. You know, now you got me in the mood to watch Blackula. I I haven't seen that since I was a kid. I yeah. love it. I they love. That used to be one of the things they would show on like late night TV. Uh, Dolomite. I, I went and looked it up and I remembered it as before I even, I still oh, didn't even right find it. Dolomite is my name is the name of the movie. It's on Netflix. It's terrific. Actually. It's, it's Eddie Murphy returning to form as somebody with talent. Um, yeah, I thought he was so, talking about the mountains. This guy totally worth your, name. totally worth your time. Even if you've never seen the Dolom the original Dolomite movies with Rudy Ray Moore. You so I'm curious now. So anyway, uh, yeah, totally worth uh, totally worth your time to to watch. Uh, Dolomite is my name. Uh, they're bringing they brought back uh, they they did coming to America too. Uh, they're bringing back uh, oh, Beverly yeah. Hills Cop too. So I'll probably watch that. Uh, but I but the 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 coming to America two was kind of, it was okay. Yeah. I, I didn't think it was great. No, no, this is so, great. There's got to be some great music in there, man. There is some great music in there, but it's also it's it's also simultaneously like a serious. But Rudy Ray Moore is not exactly a he's a very larger than life individual. Let me put it that way. So, I'm I have hopes for I haven't seen Superfly. I have seen Black Caesar, uh, which was a was a classic of of, the, of the genre. I didn't see Superfly. I the love movies. The Shaft movies are, are excellent. Fantastic. Um, plus, Shaft's a badass, and that's that's all. It's always cool to have a badass in a movie. Isn't he the dick so, that gets all the chicks? That's true. Yes, but don't get us demonetized. But, don't be the but, dick that gets us demonetized. <laughs> so, um, didn't somebody do a remake or or sequel or something like that to Blackula? I I don't remember. Maybe I'm yeah, thinking no, of Eddie Murphy's Blackula. Vampire in Brooklyn, which was there's Blackula one and Blackula two, man. And not great. I love them both. Yeah, the late night TV place uh, people would show Blackula from time to time. Isn't um, uh, what's her face? Uh, Pan Pan Greer. Pam Greer. In Blackula one. Oh, I have no idea. I think so. Yeah, let's let's say that. Uh, when I probably last saw that film, uh, I was before the prior to the age where I really would have taken notice of Pam Greer. Let me put it that way. 
God. Uh, totally worth your time to watch uh, Jackie Brown, though. Uh, for anybody that hasn't watched that, debatably Quentin Tarantino's best movie. There's uh, there's what's his face, uh, Robert De Niro in there, right? Uh, yes, actually, he's in there too. Samuel L. Jackson's in there. Um, Robert Forrester plays plays that male lead, though. How can that be bad? Look at all these actors, man. Come on. That's true. That's true. Uh, you know, there's there's a famous quote. From some movie big shot from back in the day, and I don't know who this was, might have been Louis B. Mayer or somebody like that, who 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 you know comes down, he, his his studio's been making all these movies, and then he comes down and storms on a the sound stage one day and tells tells all the people to stop making movies where people write with feathers because he doesn't like those movies. So Hollywood being Hollywood decision makers being out of touch is not a new phenomenon. Right. You know, all this because of one man. There are uh so there a, any good game about the Russian Civil War will work this in somehow. Um it is abstracted out in Ted Racer's Reds, um, but it does come into play in to, uh top the uh, time of chaos, chaos, what shit. I can't remember the exact name of that. The, you know the game I'm talking about, but the Russian Civil War. And it's totally part of... Uh, Reds? Red. Red. God damn it. Soviet Dawn as well. No, Reds is Ted's uh, Racer's game. Uh, the game I'm thinking of is a David uh, David Doctor game. Chaos. Time time of Chaos. 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 I'm totally brave. Triumph of Chaos. There you go. There was It was Chaos Rising or some shit like that. Uh, which is a is a probably to, to many people is the definitive game on the topic, uh, but it's also a mess, and you've really got to have some patience and work with it, and be prepared to deal with large quantities of Aretta. So, um, William Renz has um, an interesting uh, question. Okay, in designing a game on a historical battle or event, the question is: Do the rules and components either make the game play? give the same result as had occurred or allow for alternative outcomes. Well, so I'm going to say that as a general principle, um, a, a game that doesn't allow for alternate outcomes is probably a boring game that you're not going to play. I more see what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think such a game would have a great deal to overcome to like keep playing it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if the if the game doesn't allow, this is not exactly what William is saying here, if it doesn't allow for the historical events to occur, then I think it's probably a, a failure of, of its model. Um, I think there were relatively few games where the historical outcome is flatly impossible, but you know, some as, as we I pointed out already, in something like Over the Rhine, it's probably not flatly impossible. It's very difficult to achieve the historical. I'm not talking historical outcome at the end of the game. I'm talking historical outcome on like September 25th, right? Like like six turns in. Uh, and that, I think, is a problem. I think uh, you could do... Uh, you, uh, isn't there... A, I think there's a game on the Czech Legion, uh, either in development or uh, that that is already out. That is an interesting topic. Is it As, possible... <clears throat> Is it possible to play uh, a historical game and follow exactly the battle plans that happened on that game? You know what I mean? Like the Germans moved here with this many units at this time, and then the Americans moved here with this many units at this time. So that's a really interesting question, actually. Hold on, let me let me right, give got to give Dan a point here. Um, so. I think that presupposes a certain amount of knowledge on the part of the player of how those things actually went down historically. Well, and that information is not necessarily super easy to, to come by as far as like details of individual unit movements. A lot, a lot of history books are not going to give you that level of detail, right? So you're going to have to be pretty familiar with that topic. Yes. I think it is worth your time to do that, but if you already have the knowledge of how that happened, Maybe it's not worth it. I don't know. Maybe, maybe as a as a uh, now, what I have seen people do, and I'd I'd love to do. I just need a table. Um, is 
is to do kind of that, right? Is to okay, so it's you know it's it's eighteen oh nine. Napoleon's marching uh, up the Danube Valley. Here's where the troops start off on X day, and then kind of follow the the, the you know what does it see? Kind of reconstruct the historical events using the tools that the game has given you. I think that's potentially a super duper interesting exercise. Is that gameplay? I'm, I'm not sure that it is. Well, you know? uh, you're simulating more than gaming, I guess. Yeah. Now, in, in a sense, it's not gameplay in the sense that you, you're not really so much playing the game out of the book. Uh, you're exploring the history using the game as kind of a toolkit. Uh, but on the other hand, I'm also a believer in the idea that I bought the game. I'll do what I damn well please with it. Right. Yeah. So and, and if just, if that's I what just, I want to do with it, that's how I'm going to get my best engagement out of it. Then hell, there's nothing wrong with that. And I just thought about it. It was a stupid question because as soon as you have a battle, um, and and, and you leave it up to the dice, um, well, maybe move... you maybe you pick your die result based on what historically happened instead of rolling the dice. And then the outcome is the same as the battle. Maybe, but if you're, but if you're, what, what I'm saying is, if the point of that exercise is not to play the game, but to, but to kind of reconstruct the history from the game, then I don't see it. I, I don't see anything wrong with just using the rules to the extent that they're useful, right? But so now, if you're playing that with another person, then obviously they're going to have something to say about that, right? But um, okay, I'm just, I just seen the outcome will be different. Even though you have, no, it might be. Well, so if you're if you are following the game, so remember that the game system, right? Any game system is 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 a is a we'll call it a model or an algorithm. I'll sometimes say, right? You have an input inputs to the algorithm. You have outputs. The outcome is output is what happens, right? Um, If you are not using the algorithm as you wouldn't in the kind of exercise that we were just talking about, uh, then I there's no reason it can't evolve historically but you're not like again you're not playing the game you're not trying to like get your own narrative out of it you're trying to reconstruct the historical narrative maybe because you don't have a good source for napoleon's 1809 danube campaign and there's not that many good sources on that actually not in english anyway presumably it's easier in, if you're french and or speak yeah but if, if, if we talk about uh, battle of the bulge bruno sinigalio he's got the up to date up to date up well this is true and well and there's well so there's there are certainly topics where it's very easy to find detailed history. Okay. The battle of the bulge is one of those things. Um, it's, it's pretty easy. And, you know, a factor in that is that we know a few people who are like legit insider outsider war gaming bulge experts, right? Bruno and Danny Parker and probably a couple other people. If I have any East, if I have a, a uh, an east front question you know i could ask jack rady right for example absolutely so and uh you know there's a there's a lot of expertise there the kind of the point of the topic here tonight is to kind of feel around the borders of where our own expertise yes. intersects with what the game is doing Okay, and, and what maybe mean our own expertise. Are you? What about a guy like me who knows Squatsky about history? What this is why you are have? a per, you are the perfect example for this, right? Because let's say there's tons of historical stuff that I don't know shit about. I don't know jack about the American Revolution, for example. Yes, George George Washington crossed the Delaware, and you know they they murdered some some Hessians on Christmas Day, and that's all I know. So you said the American Civil War and you mentioned George Washington. I said, I think I said American Revolution. (laughs) I'm I'm doing a little better on the Civil War, but I'm like I said, I don't consider myself an expert on any historical period. The point is that that you know, to to what extent does does our own level of understanding, superficial that or or misguided as it may be, I mean, I'm probably wrong about some stuff too, right? So, uh, as I everybody probably is. So, you know, to what extent does that inform my opinion about a game not doing what I think doing or not doing what I think it's supposed to do based on my understanding of the history, right? Okay. Now, I feel like I'm not making a lot of sense here, Dan, because you're... Well, you're the like, thing is, is that, I mean, if you don't know squat about uh, the, the, the history uh, topic but, of the game, you're just gaming. You're but just that, playing the game. 
okay, so first of all, there's nothing wrong with that. No, and, no, no, I'm like, yeah. And second, uh, even if that is what you are doing, you still you're still picking stuff up about yes. that topic just Absolutely. by playing the game. Right Absolutely. now, maybe you d- decide you're like really interested and go get a book about it too, or watch some YouTube videos or whatever. That's all fine, but um, you, you know, you it's it's a it's a learning journey, right? I'm a firm believer that people, somebody that's just decided, I if I don't know it already, I don't need to know it. I do not understand that space alien mentality, right? I'm very much a, a we're gonna I'm gonna keep learning forever, right? I just bought a fucking I just bought a fucking calculus textbook for Pete's sake. Don't worry, it was cheap. So and, I always, and Artie, I always said that when you start reaching mathematically uh, uh, calculus levels, it becomes art. And look what's on the front cover. Of just th- th- that happens just past calculus. In my it's in art. my because opinion, look, look at look at the cover of your book. What is it, Artie? What is it? It's a it's an integration sign, but no, it's an f hole in a violin. Well, okay, it's a musical note too, but remember that I don't know. back in the day, music was considered one of the natural sciences, like astronomy. Pythagoras, so, man. So there you go. Pythagoras was a kook. Hey. So, uh, well, I think true. we could have a discussion conversation about who won this American Civil War too. So Frank Davis says somebody in England replayed Waterloo using Wellington's victory on the 200th anniversary. Oh, I'm totally watching that, Frank. Um, I'm totally watching that. Um, that sounds awesome, actually. Uh, no, I'll totally, I'll totally, uh, totally watch that. So he's talking uh, about miniatures here, right? Well, no, he's talking about his game, Wellington's Victory. Frank is the design original designer of Wellington's Victory from SPI, later republished yeah, but, okay, by TSR. So someone played the, played the, uh, the and then later the thrown into a wood tripper by Decision Games. Not, not their finest moment. So what he's saying is that on the anniversary of of Waterloo, somebody right. replayed the battle using the Wellington's victory rules. So I totally want to watch that. Okay. Uh, thank you, John Stanley. Once again, American Revolution was a civil war for away from the main armies, the Royalist troops. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's a it's a complex topic, and there's there's a certain amount of of mythologization. Mythologization. I'm not sure how I'm saying that word, but you know what I'm saying. Uh, that we as Americans are kind of subject to, and and uh, you know the the historical realities of it are never as complicated as what the sloganeering would like lead us to believe. So, so I pre- Frank, I appreciate that. If you find it, let me know. No, don't, don't hey, kill yourself, but uh, but if you find it, let me know. You know, we are talking. We were talking about experts in the field, like Bruno City Gallio, mm-hmm. uh, in, in the Battle of the Bulge. If you want to know about zombies, man, Herman Lutton. <laughs> That you know, I I I will, uh, I will agree that Herman is indeed one of our foremost experts on zombies. Foremost. So, so uh, so William Merritt says once a game has been played by the written rules, are experienced gamers likely to use house rules to add variability to a game if alternative scenarios are not provided? So I think I, there's like yeses and nos all over this. So I think experienced gamers are likely to use house rules, but they are probably not. I probably not going to do that just to add variability. I think they're going to do that because something in the game doesn't feel right to them or they think that something is too big of a hassle to handle, so they house rule it away. Um, I think that's where house rules tend to come from. So, uh, but, but I'm also a big advocate of the first time you play the game, you should really try and play it as close to the rules as written as possible so that that way later on, when you want to fiddle with it, you have a better understanding of what you need to fiddle with. Charles Lenin points out that the American Revolution was also a French proxy war. Yes, indeed. The royalist French were not super huge on American talk of freedom and liberty and all that jazz. Nor nor were the royalist Spanish, uh, nor the Dutch at that point particularly. Yeah, so the... I've been I've been uh, reading about this actually. Pythagoras did not come up with the Pythagorean theorem. The ancient Babylonians knew about it at least fifteen hundred years before Pythagoras. Pythagoras may have have created a mathematical proof for it, though. Also, remember that the Pythagoras like started the Pythagorean school, and the way those schools operated, they tend to they tended to name 
um, or credit the founder of the school with whatever the school came up with. So it may or may not have been Pythagoras, Pythagoras. It might have been, you know, Pythagoras' student's student or something like that. Also, they were wacky. If you read about the Pythagoreans. All right. So uh, what Stacking Limit says, depends on the gamers. Absolutely, it does. Game of the group of people that refuse to use house rules. Uh RPG people or war game people? I assume war game people. Uh, there's, I think, I mean, we play, let's say OCS, right? Which we, you know, we play a fair amount of. Uh, we we play with, I don't know that we play with any house rules, but we do play with some of the options. Um, like the, uh, like the uh, proportional losses rule, for example. We have always played with that. So, There you go. There you go. Dan is our subject matter expert on these topics. So, herbalism. I like that. Recreational herbalism. Hey, you know what I'm saying? Herbal. Do you say herb or herb, Dan? Herb. Herb? Yeah. They're okay. herbs. So you say it the French way. The British get upset if you say it that way. Les herbes. I'm just saying. That's how the French say it. The Americans say, say it for the French way, and they get annoyed when we say it the French way. What about the sing a song? Do you pronounce the G? Sing a song. Not normally, no. Well, there's a G at the end. It's not silent. Uh, there's a G at the end, but there isn't. There isn't a phonetic G at the end, right? So you've got. Do, do we sing. really want? I, I, you're going to probably get at least eight minutes of, of this, okay? So there's a thing called the International Phonetic Alphabet, okay? Which okay. is, in, in principle, does, does not quite this capable, but in principle, it'll let you write down in phonetic symbols any sound from any human language, okay? Again, it's a little less capable than that, but it, that's like an actual thing. The ING, or the NG at the end of sing is a different sound or combination of sounds than one finds in the word finger, I-N-G-E-R. It's a different oh, sound. So if you say it, sing, finger, there's, there's, there's one sound there that the ng sound that is in both words, but then finger throws a G at the end of it. Sing does not. Yeah, but there's so, an E-R after the G. If you say singer, sure. Singer, I'm not sure singer. I've ever... You know, there's a lot of dialectical variation in English. I don't know that yeah, I know I anybody you. personally that says singer. Unless what they're pronouncing linger? somebody's name. Linger. Linger? Linger would be an example. Like finger, uh, there's a, there's an extra G. There's two sounds there, okay? So what, what you're looking at is you got that NG in, in two words. Sing and finger or linger or whatever. You got... That, that NG is one sound in sing, the ng sound, and it's two sounds in finger, ng. That's because English or English phonetics sucks. So so the the the, the, um, the English mechanics and, and phonics of the English language is an incredibly difficult language to learn if you don't have it is considered bah. a fairly difficult language to and learn, yes. Because man, There's, you gotta learn it by I learned it by rote. You know what I mean? The orthography of English is really complicated for a couple of reasons. One, the, the simplest reason is simply that we are using a script, which happens to be an alphabet, that was not designed for our language. It was designed for Latin. And the Romans made changes to the, the Greek and, and or Etruscan alphabets um, to suit their language. And it suits Latin fairly well, even even including a lot of Greek loan words, a lot of things that you'll. There are some interesting like orthographic features in Latin where that'll let you tell a lot of the time where with that the word originally came from Greek, right? But yeah, Latin is a is a is an Italic language or Romance language, yeah. And English is not right. No, there's a whole bunch of sounds. That's why we have there's like 23 different vowel sounds in English. Why do we only have five friggin' letters that use that we use for vowels? It's a huge mess. Plus, you've got the history of English where, okay, so we've got the people that spoke what we might call English at the time invaded an island, and there were some people living there already, and then they absorbed some of their words. 
Uh, and the pri prior to that, the Romans had been there, and they some some of their words had stuck around in the local populace. And then a couple hundred years later, some Vikings came in, and they ran the place for 60 years. Um, and then a couple generations after that, the French came in and invaded. Then we had this, you know, Renaissance and Age of Reason thing where we incorporated a lot of Latin and Greek words back into the language, so one some of which came power. through French and some of which came directly from Latin and Greek. And then we had the British Empire, which stole words from everybody. So when was the when was the Great Vowel uh, shift? Oh God, what, what uh, year was that? Uh, it's po uh, pre Chaucer. I can tell you that because uh, Chaucer you could kind of understand, kind of. If you so hear we're talking spoken. 1300s? Yeah, something like that. Something like that. <clears throat> oh, this is excellent. I actually have uh, I actually have listened to a good chunk of this podcast. Uh, this dude started with uh, this dude started with Proto Indo European, though. So he started at literally ground zero. What the hell are you talking about? Uh, written English is not intended to be for that. Yeah, well, that's true, but uh, well, web. There's there's no magical authority granted to Webster because he wrote a dictionary, right? So maybe, maybe, maybe we could. Well, uh, Charles uh, Lenny says Valship was Elizabethan. That actually okay, sounds so more correct to me. Uh, but then it so doesn't kind of explain where um, maybe I'm maybe I'm misplacing Chaucer here, something like that. So 1500s that that sounds about right that, and that's a big a big made a big difference between like English and German right so so anyway right started talking about linguistics I took I I had I have an interest in linguistics right I I, oh, I that's shit. kind of it's kind of a problem of mine where I'm interested in tons and tons and tons of different stuff. Well, you correct um, everybody. You correct everybody when they speak. Oh, I'm a. I can be obnoxious. I've oh I've learned to control. I've learned to control that to some extent. Uh, this makes complete sense. I love herb garlic. This makes complete sense. See, herb garlic. I thought I thought turkeys could fly. Yeah, that's not herb garlic. Or it's not. No, that was Les Nesman. That yeah, you're right. That was Les Nesman. <laughs> Useless information, man. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't seen that in a while. I didn't even see it at uh, in in. Uh, yeah, that's about right. Uh, One hundred fifty years or so pre Shakespeare, something like that. Uh, I, I don't know about for traveler, but uh, no, I have done some con uh, conlang or constructed language stuff for, for fantasy world building in the past too. At one point, this was after. Um, I had I had driven down to the OSU bookstore when I was not a student at OSU. I had driven down to the OSU bookstore to just buy a textbook on linguistics. So, you, so you that created I created your own language. You know, I got a certain amount of the way into it. Yeah. Jesus Christ! Why don't you just have a beer? Well, right, exactly. It is. This is very, very noodly stuff. Okay, and it's interesting, but the, the point is, I'm interested in languages, right? I took I took a linguistics class in in college, and a class on linguistics that is. Plus, over the years, I took French in high school, Spanish in college, um, Latin, uh, German in college later on, Latin in college, um, and have studied a little bit of Russian on my own. And I, I don't know that I'm comfortable speaking in any of these languages, but and, if you, and which, which, if which you force me to speak, uh, so if you force me to talk to somebody in German, I might be able to. Well, uh, what, what language do you find uh, most difficult in ones you studied? Russian. Really, eh? Oh yeah. So the, it's not the alphabet, though. The, you get the you memorize the alphabet pretty quickly. That's not the problem. Uh, the problem is the grammar is super confusing. So that all all verbs are basically irregular in Russian, as far as I can tell. So it it really kind of it's 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 difficult. So it's a um, language a language learned by rote. Well, sure, but I mean, all all languages can be learned that way. I mean, yeah, yeah, whole yeah. Japanese is very difficult, but I've no never, easy. I've never, Japanese is easy. Other than memorizing the numbers one through five, I can't. I've never tried to even study the Japanese language at all. Easy. So, <laughs> So, so is Greek. So is ancient Greek. Now, I've never done anything formal with ancient Greek either, but I can, 
I more or less know the Greek alphabet. That's about it. You know, but if you know the Greek alphabet, you're you're like eighty percent of the way toward knowing the Cyrillic alphabet too. Really? Yeah, because it's based on a Greek alphabet. It's Saint Cyril's alphabet, who was Greek. I didn't know that. And you know, one of my friends, his mother is a PhD in ancient Greek um, uh, history or whatever, uh, and she read Homer in its original language. Now that's something. That's something. So this is te- so I, I see where William Aaron's is coming from. So r- understand that when I use the word script, I mean system of writing that somebody might use. So there's a bunch of different kinds of sim- uh, uh, of <laughs> systems of writing. Okay, there's pictographic things which we saw all over the world. There might be uh, logographic scripts. There's syllabic scripts, for example, uh, uh, Devanagari, which is used to write a lot of the Indian languages, a syllabic script. So a particular symbol won't mean one sound. It's the symbol for a syllable, for example. Uh, so a couple of the Japanese scripts are syllabaries like this too. So the first alphabet that we knew about was the Phoenician alphabet that was later picked up by the Greeks and then by the Etruscans. And then after, from there, they adapt, adapted it to um, uh, Latin. Uh, but remember that all of that, they all changed, right? Uh, they added letters and dropped letters and all that stuff. Where where we, uh, they, since the Roman Empire, have basically made two changes to letters in the, in the Latin script, and that's about it. We added a, a U and we added an I or a J, and that's a it. A J. Yeah, that's, those are the only letters that we, we've added. Uh, and that's, you know why do we do that so there's like all kinds of sounds that just don't have letters there's just not three letters so so i don't i don't think this is the fact that you know it originally came from the phoenician alphabet that's a real problem that we're, we're using something that's a bit distant from the phoenician alphabet at this point so i can say naughty things in hungarian too I uh, one of my uh peer one of my uh office mates was a hungarian woman which as a matter of fact it's incredibly difficult that language. So Hungarian Magyar is uh, uh, one of the three languages in Europe that is not an Indo-European language. Finnish and Basque are the other ones. So it's not uh, they've all of those have had a lot of influence from Indo-European languages, right? But the the Finno-Ugric languages that Finnish and um, and Hungarian are part of kind of migrated in to Europe in late antiquity or the Middle Ages. Basque is like the only thing left of it is supposed uh, of the indigenous inhabitants of Europe, their language anyway, before Indo Europeans came in and took the whole place yeah. over. Yeah, Basque. So, but obviously it's been, you know, it's been evolving in contact with French and Spanish and Latin for at least 2,500 years. So that, you know, there's a lot of borrowing between Basque and those are those languages to Basque, I should say. I get my sweet hot peppers from the Basque region. The Basque. Oh, okay. I don't know anything about that. Piment d'Espelette. Okay. Are they known for their spicy peppers? Uh, Sweet spicy peppers, please. Okay. You know, use the term correctly. Okay. There we go. Cuneiform. Yes. You know, a lot of the, uh, the 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 methods, you know, the, the look of letters is often informed by what was used to write them, right? There is some, uh, like, po- there's, I don't know about Polynesia, Southeast Asia, somewhere in Southeast Asia, they have these very rounded looking letters because when they would write, they would write on leaves. And you could, if you cut a straight line in a leaf, you'd cut a hole in the leaf. So they had to be rounded letters. So... There are some scripts that leave all the vowels out. Arabic leaves all, and Hebrew leave all the vowels out. You just got to know where the vowels go. Really? Yes. Or, or you're reading the Quran or the Old Testament, in which case you, they, they put them in those books. It's, well, all it's consonants. not all consonants. They have vowels, but they don't write the vowels down. You just got to know from context what vowels to put in. So, yes. So, this is a lot of uh, uh, it's an interesting topic. Let me put it that way. Let it be known, Artie, that you are the one who went off topic today, not me. That's possible. That's possible. 
Um, no, I, I st- as soon as you ask somebody asked the question about en- the evolution of English, English phonetics and shit like that, that's when you got the the diatribe. All that's right, folks. William Arends or something. We will be back next week with a very special guest. We don't know who that will be yet. Dan, get to work on that. In the meantime, remember we're on Tuesdays now for the uh, t- until further notice. So, so seven thirty p.m. Tuesdays. Why, uh, what's going to happen until further notice? Well, it's something that might change, and we might have to move again. I don't know, but until further notice, we're on Tuesdays. Right. Uh, remind everybody that the Armchair Dragoons Digital Convention is this weekend, so tune in to that over at armchairdragoons.com. I'll be doing uh, the opening happy hour show at 8 p.m. on Friday, which will be broadcast live here as well, and I will be doing the OCS Boot Camp at 7 p.m. Eastern, this is all Eastern time on Saturday. So it's going to be very, very exciting. And I asked Brent, Brent, if you need any help with anything, uh, I- I'm available. I-, I guess he didn't ask me, so uh, that's ridiculous. You do have the, you, you, you know, Dan. Dan has this like aura of unreliability about him, and he is in yeah. fact not particularly unreliable. Who? Um, but you, but people mistake you for an unreliable person all the time. Are you kidding me? I'm, it's I'm, true. I'm, I'm, I'm tight. You're pr- no, you're pretty reliable, actually. Yeah. A little scattered, but you know, pretty well. Basically, pretty reliable. Yeah. Much more reliable than everybody thinks. Ha! Those people are all wrong. Ha! All right, folks. We will see you all next week. Thanks for watching. Thumbs up the video. Subscribe to the channel. Check out Dan's channel. All that jazz. We'll see you again soon. Big move. Big way. The moose is loose. Big moves. Big way. The moose is loose. Big moves. Big way. The moose is loose. Big. Big. Big.